when the Shulchan Aruch introduces the fast of Tisha B'Av as well as the other fast days that surround the Temple experience and the loss of our independence in Israel, it highlights the fact that prior to the fast day of Tisha B'Av is the fast day of the 17th of Tammuz. And the Shulchan Aruch writes that even though when it came to the first Temple, it would be appropriate not to fast on the 17th day of Tammuz, but rather on the ninth day of Tammuz, because the first temple, the walls around Jerusalem were surrounded at that period of time. The Shulchan Aruch writes, even though it tells us regarding the first temple that it was on the ninth day of the month of Tammuz that the city was surrounded. We do not fast on the ninth day of Tammuz, but on the 17th. Why? Even though when it came to the first temple, the walls of Jerusalem were surrounded on the ninth day of Tammuz, when it came to the second temple, what happened was the walls of the city of Jerusalem were destroyed and were beginning, and they began the incursion in Jerusalem on the 17th day of Tammuz. So therefore the rabbis decided that instead of fasting on the ninth day of Tammuz, we fast on the 17th day of Tammuz because our focus is on the second temple. Mishum de Chorbim Bayasheni, as Rav Yosef Karo says, because of the destruction of the second temple, Chamerlan, is more, we feel that with a more intense uh, spirit of sadness, simply because the results of the second temple and its destruction continue to affect us in the here and now. Even though the first temple, uh, its beauty and the presence of God was felt with more intensity than the second temple, the Shulchan Aruch concludes that we are much more concerned about the destruction of the second temple than we are of the first. Now the reasons for the destruction of the first and second temple are different. The Talmud tells us that the first base of Migdash was destroyed because of Gilu Arayot, that the Jewish people were promiscuous in their relationships of Odazara because they were involved in idol worship and because they did not embrace the laws of Shemitah, the laws of the sabbatical year. But when it came to the second temple, the destruction of the second temple was predicated on one sin and one sin only because of Sinat Chinam, because of baseless hatred between one Jew to another. And that is Chamerlan. That one sin of not treating a, a Jew, another Jew with respect, has affected us with greater intensity than the three sins that caused the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash. However, when we read through the keynote Echa last night, and today through the keynote that we read until the afternoon, we introduce the whole notion of keynote with the book that focuses on the destruction of the first temple, the book of Echa, or as the Talmud calls it, the book of keynote. Echa is unique, as Rabbi Salavechik explains, because we do something on Tisha B'Av that we never do any other time during the year, and it's not the norm for Jewish people to do this. And that is, Echa is about asking, why did this tragedy happen to us? Why did this happen? What, what created this great chasm between God and His people? Normally, when a tragedy befalls us, either personally or community, from a community perspective, we don't focus on why it happened as much as now that it has happened, what can we do to resolve this crisis? But Tisha B'Av, at least the first half a day, the night of Tisha B'Av and up to Chatzot and up to midday, our focus is not how to repair the relationship, but we focus on the challenges. What caused this crisis? In fact, because it is, as the Shulchan Aruch says, Chamerlan, it is so severe. For the first half a day, we actually create a, a divorce between ourselves and God. We refuse to wear tefillin, or the halacha is that we don't wear tefillin, because we don't celebrate the romantic relationship that we have with God. We take out certain passages from our prayer service, depending on the minhag, the custom of the community, but in particular, we take out the passage from the Kaddish that says, Tiskabel that God should accept our prayers. 
Our focus for the first half of the day is not to create a reconnection to God. It's to ask us why something like this happened. Why we have this chasm between ourselves and the Kaddish Baruch Hu, between ourselves and God. The destruction of the Second Temple, which affected the Jewish people during the time of the Crusades, the Chalmaniski massacres, the Holocaust, and continues to affect us even in the most recent events as Israel is attacked uh, by all nations after it tries to protect itself in the most recent example with the challenge of the Fertilla. And so how are we supposed to focus on this notion of reconnecting to God? What is the reason why we have this terrific chasm between ourselves, between the Jewish people and the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Rabbi Soloveitchik was also fond in saying that if you want to understand how a word is being used by the prophets, in this case the word Echa, you should look at the first time that it is used in the Bible, in Tanakh. And the word Echa, its first time it's used is in Bereshit, chapter 3, verse 9. It is used at a point in which Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, sin. And God is looking for Adam and Chava. It says that by Yishmu it called Hashem Elokim, they hear the voice of God, Metalech Began, so to say, reverberating within the Garden of Eden. Vayikra at Hashem Elokim El Adam, and God here uses the name of God, the God of intimacy, Yudke Vavke, the God of Elokim, the God of power, calls to Adam and Eve, Bayomrlo Ayaka, where are you? Ayeka, where are you? Echa, how could this rift happen between ourselves and God? Is the exact same word, it's just pronounced differently. And in order to deal with this national calamity of Echa, how did this happen? In order to solve this, we as individuals have to ask ourselves the question of Ayeka, where are we? How do we live up to our responsibility of dealing with, as the Shulchan Aruch says, Chamerlan? that the Second Temple's destruction is so great that it affects us now because of the sin of Sinat Chinam, a baseless hatred. What do we do to repair that challenge that affects us in the world in the here and now? There's an interesting Gemara in Yuma and Daf Chafbet. The Gemara in Yuma and Daf Chafbet speaks about the whole idea of how the Kohanim would worship and would offer uh, various sacrifices and do various Avoda, various temple services in the Beit HaMikdash. Sometimes it would, the person was chosen, the Kohen was chosen based on lotteries, and sometimes, at least initially, there was almost like a race of who arrived, let's say, at the top of the altar first. They would be responsible to remove the ash from the past day and prepare the altar for future sacrifices, the sacrifices of the day. We find in Yuma, on page 23a, Chav Gimel Amad Aleph, the following story. Tanu Rabbanan, our rabbis learn. Two Kohanim were ascending the ramp to the top of the altar. And one Kohen was beating the other one in this race to the top of the altar. The one that was losing did the following. Natal Sakin Vataka Lobalibo. He took a, he took a, a knife and he stabbed the other Kohen in his heart to stop him from getting to the top. How did the people respond? Ahmad Rabbi Tzadok, Amalot Ha'ulam, Rabbi Tzadok stands in the hallway of the temple and he says, my brothers, my brothers and sisters, who will bring the Egla Arufa, who will go through the process of dealing with the challenge when a, um, when a person is murdered and we do not know who murdered that person, who will go through the entire procedure when it happens within the temple itself. He cries out, is it the responsibility of the priests that live within the temple itself? Is it the responsibility of the citizens of Jerusalem where the Beit HaMikdash is found? And at the same time that this is happening, where Rabbi Tzadok is crying out about this issue, the Talmud tells us, that the father comes in, ba aviv shotinok. The father of the child comes in, umatzu kishahu mifarfer, and sees that his son that has been stabbed is not yet dead. 
Amar harehu kapartchen, he should be a kapara for all of us, because adayin, because my son is still um, not yet dead, he's still he's critically ill, he's still moving around, and therefore let us remove the sakin, let us remove the knife, because the knife that stabbed my son is not yet tame, is not yet ritually impure, because my son is not yet dead. Look at the two different personalities involved with this story. You have the rabbi, Rabbi Tzadok, who asks the question, who will perform the ceremony of the Eglah Rufa? Which actually makes no sense here, because it's not that we don't know who killed this Kohen. It's not like it happened within the city, it happened within the temple, and we know that the, the procedure of Eglah Rufa is not offered in the temple. And you have the father, who is concerned about the religious issues of ritual impurity. The message that the Talmud is trying to communicate to us here is that sometimes in our zealousness to serve God, we just misunderstand our responsibilities. Rabbi Tzadok realized that there was no need for the process of the Egla Arufa in this case. We knew who murdered the Kohen, and the Egla Arufa is not to be done when something happens within Jerusalem. But Rabbi Tzadok is trying to tell us that if in the expression of our religious zeal to God, we are willing to kill somebody else, either physically or, in any, or symbolically, then we have missed the message about what service to God is all about. If in the process of serving God, we are, we are willing to engage in sinas chinam, a baseless hatred, then we have missed the message. When a father looks at the situation, and all that he is worried about is the halachic issue of whether there will be ritual impurity in the precincts of God instead of the existential crisis that such an event creates, then we have missed the mark of what our responsibilities are as Jews. And therefore the Shulchan Aruch tells us that on this day, on this day of Tisha B'Av, our focus is on the second temple because Chamerlan because it has, we were destroyed as a people, not because of an external enemy. We were destroyed as a people because of the lack of respect that we have for others. The Netziv, the famous Rosh Yeshiva of Velazhen, Rav Natawi Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, who lived from 1816 to 1893, wrote an introduction to every book of the Chumash. And in his introduction to Sefer Bereshit, he writes, that the rabbis call the book of Bereshit, the book of Genesis, the stories of our patriarchs and matriarchs, Sefer Hayashar, the book of integrity, the book of being straight, the book of having a certain sense of morality. And then Nitziv in his introduction writes, why is this book called such? Because it highlights the ideas that the greatness of the patriarchs and matriarchs was not just their service to God. Abraham was willing to leave his interaction with God in order to welcome in strangers, but it was their capacity to be able to engage other human beings. And the Nitzv in his introduction writes the following about the tragedy of the Second Temple. He writes that there were great tzaddikim, shahayut tzaddikim v'chasidim v'omlei Torah, there were great pious people. There were major schools in which people were engaged in the study of Torah, that our young men and young women were well-versed not only with the laws of Orachayim, of the daily activities, but the laws of Tuman, Tahara, the laws of ritual impurity, the more complicated laws within our body of halachic literature. The tragedy was not that they weren't involved in the study of Torah. The tragedy was they weren't involved in the proper engagement with other human beings. Because of their baseless hatred one to another. They thought that a Jew that did not observe exactly the way they did, to the left of them or to the right of them, was a tztuki and apikores, was, was not to be engaged with, was, a, was an apikores, was a person that one should not have any relationship with. And the schism, the silos that were created in the second temple between one Jew to another Jew, created the sinat chinam, created the shvichut damim, created this 
environment in which there were very literate Jews who could not embrace another Jew with respect. Shachadosh Baruch Hu Yashar, God is straight, ve'eno sovel tzadikim ke'ilu. He cannot digest, he cannot stomach the fact that there are righteous people who act this way. Ela ba'ofen shahochim ederech ha'yashar, gam ba'lichot olam. That every single person who is engaged in the study of Torah also has to have the capacity to embrace every single Jew with respect. And not to treat another Jew with disrespect, not to ignore, not to in some ways attack or discriminate against another Jew. Even though you think you're doing this in the name of God, as the Natsiv says, Goreim Chorban Habriyav Arisut Yishuv Haaretz. This caused the destruction of the temple. This caused the incapacity for God to still create a romantic rendezvous with the Jewish people. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves as we move from the first half of Tisha B'Av, the Tisha B'Av of Eicha, of how did this happen, to Ayeka, how can we resolve this challenge? How can we deal with these issues? What are we doing today to rebuild the base of Mikdash? Too, too often, we judge other people in a fashion that creates sinas chinam, that creates baseless hatred, instead of creating avad chinam, of repairing the tear that came between ourselves and the Kaddish Baruch Hu from the time of the Second Temple period. You know, what's interesting, that in the introduction to the Sidur of the Eidot HaMizrach, as well as the Sidur of the Sephardic community, as well as the Sidur of Chabad, and the Magan Avram writes that this should also be enunciated by those within the Ashkenazic sect who pray with an Ashkenaz Sidur. There is an introductory prayer. In some Sidurim, it's just one line. In other Sidurim, it is a full paragraph, a prayer that's a paragraph wrong, long. Let me read to you a little bit of this prayer. Right before we're about to engage in the prayer service in the morning with God, it says, the shame Yichud Kuchu Brichu As I'm about to work to unite HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and to create a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Hareini miskabel alai, accept upon myself my relationship with God, His power, v'yirato v'avato, my fear of God, my respect of God, my love of God, v'hinini aved l'Hashem Yisbarach, and I am a servant of God. And as I'm about to engage in this relationship with God, I say, Hareini miskaye mitzvah, I accept upon myself the mitzvah of loving every Jew as I love myself. And I love every single Jew as I love my own soul. Why is this a necessary introduction to prayer? Why is it that the Baal HaTanya demanded that this be recited? Why is it that Nusach Sfard and Nusach Eidot HaMizrach which are the earlier nusachot of the Sidur, has this paragraph in it. Because you cannot engage in a relationship with God if you're not willing to treat another human being with respect. We need to ask ourselves this question on Tisha B'Av. On the time in which we're supposed to bring the coming of Messiah, we're told that on the day of Tisha B'Av, Mashiach is born. Well, Mashiach is born through our activities when we're able to move from Echa to Ayaka and say we're here to resolve this crisis within Knesset Yisrael, within the Jewish people. It is interesting that Echa and Megillat Esther, two different Megillot that are read at different experiences within the Jewish calendar, one the most tragic day in some way, and, and one arguably the most joyous day of the Jewish calendar, has the same cantillations, has the same trap. And you will hear the sounds of Megillat Esther in Echa, and you will hear the sounds of Echa and Megillat Esther. The trap is exactly the same. The cantillations are exactly the same. The difference between Echa and Megillat Esther is just one thing. And that is the way in which the reader intones the Megillah. The way in which the reader reads the sentences. And that's because the difference between the redemption of Megillah Esther, when a Jew was able to find God, not through some divine miracles, 
but in his and her heart, his or her mind, was willing to create a spirit of unity. The difference between that day and the day of Tisha B'Av is simply our voice, the way the reader enunciates. We have the capacity to move from the paradigm of Echa to the paradigm of Megillah Esther simply by the way we articulate, the way we intone, the way we engage. We can make those differences. It's up to us. That is why the word for redemption and the word for diaspora are exactly the same words with one letter difference. The word for diaspora is gola, exile. The word for redemption is geula. The only difference between those two words is the letter aleph. Because the letter aleph, which represents ani, my, me, the role I play really defines whether the state of the Jewish people will be one of a diaspora experience or the state of the Jewish people will be one of a redemptive experience. I decide whether we are in a state of redemption of Gula or in a state of Gola every single time I embrace another Jew. I decide in the way I engage in my workplace, in the way I engage around my Shabbos table, in the way I engage with members of my family, in the way I engage with Jews who do not see their relationship with God the same way I do. I decide whether I am enunciating the prose of Megillah and Esther or the sorrow of Sefer Kinot of Eicha. I decide if I'm involved in Gola or Gula. The answer is in our hands. We can make the difference. If we understand the message of the Shulchan Aruch, that it's Chamerlam, that the destruction of the Second Temple was greater, and its, and its results, its challenges, have been greater for the Jewish people, we can make a difference because it's up to us to move from a paradigm of Sinat Chinam to Avat Chinam. It's interesting. Every single Haftorah of the year, every Haftorah of the year, has words of redemption etched within them. And that's because the Haftorah, there's an argument amongst the scholars when it was inserted in Jewish history, was inserted at a time in which the Jewish people were going through tumultuous times with an external enemy. Every single Haftorah must have redemption. Even the Haftorah that we read on Tisha B'Av, on Tisha B'Av at Mincha time, has words of redemption etched within it. The only Haftorah, the Jewish calendrical cycle, that does not have words of redemption etched within the Haftorah is the Haftorah of Parshat Vayeshev. The Haftorah which focuses on the Parsha in which a Jew sold another Jew into slavery, in which the brothers of Yosef were willing to sell Yosef into slavery. Rome can, build, can burn the base of Mikdash, and there can be words of redemption. But when a Jew sells another Jew into slavery, there can never be words of redemption. When we don't treat every Jew with respect, we'll never be able to rebuild the Second Temple. It's predicated on that paradigm. That's what the rabbis are trying to communicate. Let me just conclude with the story. The Brander table has been blessed with many guests, and guests have always enriched our table, and we have benefited from their wisdom, we have benefited from those interactions. Um, a few years ago, my wife is a pediatric occupational therapist. She was treating um, one of her clients, and one of her clients told her that the way they were going to celebrate Pesach, the Passover Seder, was simply they were going to watch a Sesame Street video about Passover and eat some matzah while they were watching that video on the night of the Seder. My wife came home slightly disturbed by that. And we decided that on one of the days of Pesach we would invite this family over, obviously inviting them for a whole Seder that's slightly longer than the Sesame Street video might be too much of a challenge. We invited them over, they came over, and we engaged in conversation between various uh, parts of the meal. And towards the end of the meal, as dessert is being served, the, the mother of the child that my wife works with starts speaking about her husband in very glowing terms and starts speaking about the fact that they go out every single Friday night, the family goes out, not just the immediate family, but the extended family, to have a meal together to the Outback Steakhouse, not exactly a kosher location. And she knows 
that if she brings her parents to this Outback Steakhouse, that she has to tell them not to speak words of evil gossip because her husband's parents will stop the conversation, will change the conversation. If there's any words of evil gossip happening at the Outback Steakhouse as they have their family interaction together. And she continues to tell us how her family, her husband's family and business is so careful in which they engage with other people that often they return the money if they don't feel they have, they have fulfilled what they promised uh, their clients. And as everybody else, with the exception of myself, is having seconds on dessert, what happens is the, the husband turns to me and says, you might know my great-grandfather. He wasn't as great of a rabbi as you are. I understand his synagogue was not as big as yours, but you might know him. I never really know much about him, but you might know him. His name was the Chafetz Chaim. I turn to him, and I'm looking at the great-grandchild of the Chafetz Chaim who had a Passover Seder using the Sesame Street video. And I turn to him, and I share with him and his wife the greatness and the richness of the Chavetz Chaim and how he was one of the greatest rabbis and there is easily no rabbi in this generation that raises to the stature of the Chavetz Chaim. And then I went to my library, got him a copy of Guard Your Tongue and gave it to him, which he took home. And then I realized something. The Chavetz Chaim was so careful about the way he treated other people, issues of Lashon Hara, issues of business ethics, that it became a genetic marker in this family. That even though this family has lost part of their tradition due to the challenges of the Holocaust, which created a severing of tradition, the genetic markers that the Chafetz Chaim created through his ethics affected his great-grandchildren in ways that he must probably never imagined. If we could just inculcate what this couple has at the Outback Treif Steakhouse every Friday night in our interactions with other people. Perhaps if we did that around our Shabbos table, we would make it a little bit more kosher and we would help build the level of the Jewish people by making sure that we would respond to Sinat Chinam, Sinat Chinam with Avat Chinam with unconditional love. May this day of Tisha B'Av ultimately move from a day of fasting to a day of deliverance through recognizing that we can move from Gola to Gula through our actions and through our activities.